So I just want to pray and thank you, Lord, for bringing everyone back uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, this day and for the teaching that I will offer. Uh, I pray especially that the ministry examples that I will share today will help lead each person into a deeper understanding of Emmanuel prayer and uh, will help us remember most of all that you are a God who is with us always. You are our redeemer, creator, and healer. So thank you, Lord, for uh, all that will happen today uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. Okay, so we're going to uh, start uh, beginning at uh, on the back, on the second page, belief system. We we ended up talking about restoring the heart last time. And uh, just just to begin, you know, we, we talk about asking questions and why do we ask questions. Uh, the, the question, it's not so much what question we ask. It's, it's mostly that we give the Holy Spirit, give Jesus a chance to speak. Okay, it's, it's, it's creating that sacred space where we wait on him and see what we sense here and, and then feel about what the Lord is saying. So that's the really critical place that we give space to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, sometimes you might be led to just receive a specific question, which ends up being the right question in the moment at the right time, which can unlock uh, the door to a person's healing. For example, uh, there was a woman who came in who was uh, very resistant to the things of God. Turned out she had a, dabbled in a cult and that had been in her family. The, you know, you could just feel there was a certain amount of darkness that came into the room with her. So had to pray against, do a lot of spiritual warfare as we, as we moved into praying with her. This actually was the same woman, remember I told you last week, a woman, when I asked her if you ever had healing prayer before, and she said, yeah, I did this thing with Jesus where he asked a question, not doing that anymore. Okay, this is the same, the same woman. So when we, she, she, was, um, she was receptive to prayer, but again, there was just something around her that felt a little uneasy. So when I prayed to open up a kind of sacred holy place to begin ministry, uh, I specifically asked the Lord to send an angel to come into the room and, and sit next to her so that she would begin to feel the presence of the Lord in that room. And so then I felt, I felt led to ask her this question. And I said, God, what's the one thing that's missing in Mary's experience of you? And she had had her head down and we waited. I waited, I was watching her. She had her head down for a long time. She started to sort of tremble just a little bit in her body is what I noticed. And slowly she began to look up and she revealed a huge smile on her face. Her face was literally radiant. There was something just like beaming from her face. And with wide eyes and a big smile, she looked at me and she said, God is safe. And I said, yeah, God is safe. And she said it again, God is safe. It was as if this revelation from heaven just dropped out of the sky and hit her, and it was just the most amazing thing she had ever heard. Obviously, she had never experienced God as being safe. And so in that moment, she received that as truth. She received it, I could tell, in her body, soul, and spirit. And she kept saying it. She kept repeating it. God, see if she started crying and weeping. And all I did was sit there and just affirm, yeah, yeah, God saved. God saved. It was good. Yeah, it was really good. And she just kept repeating it and repeating it. It kept soaking in. We really didn't get to any ministry because at that point, she just needed to continue to receive this truth. So sometimes you will get just a specific question that the Lord will just 
drop into your mind that you that you ask and it can unlock unlock the door okay so we're going to talk about uh, belief system the power of belief because what we believe will determine how we act we all I, I'm sure believe that's true as well but let me just give you an example a really a strong example of this if you think of a person who is anorexic what is their belief what are they believing about themselves they're believing they're fat mm -hmm. yeah and no matter what anyone might say to them oh you're not fat you're not overweight truly anorexic people believe with every fiber in their being that they're fat there's nothing that will remove that belief in their mind and some anorexic people will take that belief so far that they come to the point of death they've lost their body completely so the power of belief is something we need to pay attention to and find out what people are believing so question number one in the midst of what you're struggling with what did you begin to believe about yourself about others and about God so about God uh, we know that what we believe about God is always more important than the circumstances we find ourselves in okay it's really important to find out what people believe about God what you believe about yourself also has tremendous power over your life if someone says to you I never felt the unconditional love of my parents so I must be unlovable and if they truly believe they're unlovable we can only imagine what kind of difficulties that will unleash in their life so often this is tied to lies uh, what lies is the person believing about themselves questions are what do you think God would say about that belief would God say that's true as you have grabbed hold of that belief system how has it affected your life if that belief system is not serving you well would you be willing to partner with God and his truth in this area what do you need from God to help you do this okay so these are all questions that that can be helpful when people are believing things about themselves that's not true there's a little book yeah that's back here that I looked at this book is really good for that oh yeah and there's declarations all in here so you can change your belief okay. absolutely that is an awesome book that's from Craig Miller and actually I was the one that stocked the library with those books because oh, I hand that out in ministry to people because mm -hmm. I always usually always have one with me because it's tied to identity right. and people who are struggling or experienced trauma they have lost to some degree their true identity and that book is really short, which I like about it. Just short paragraphs that I that talk about each specific thing that relates to their identity, self-worth. Declaring your worth by Craig Miller. It's and he also has written it in Spanish too. I've actually gotten some of the Spanish ones for giving it to, to people who need that translation. And so also then what you believe about others that also will have tremendous power over your life for example a woman uh, came to me for prayer and she had developed a belief system about men that was literally wreaking havoc in her life she came in and said that well she's in a relationship with a guy that she really cares about but she can't seem to commit to him he's a great guy they have lots of fun together and she says what's wrong with me I'm just stuck in this place I can't move forward in the relationship with this with this guy well beginning to ask her some questions and, and find out about her life I discovered 
that, first of all, she'd been married three times, all ended in divorce. So right there, to me, that's a red flag. There's some, some issue about men in her life. And so I, I asked her, I said, well, tell me a little bit about your relationship with your father. In other words, let's, let's go back to the very first man in your life who had power and authority over you. What was, what was that like? And she looked at me with kind of an odd look and she said, do you want me to tell you what my first memory of my father is? I said, yes, if you're, if you're willing. She said, my first memory of my father was when I was three years old. And my father took me in his arms and walked out the front of my house, put me in the back seat of a car, buckled my seatbelt, and the woman who was driving the car was going to drive me to an orphanage. And that is the first memory I have of my father. So what do you think she began to believe about men? Can't trust. They abandon you. Can't trust, can't trust them. They're not gonna stick with you. They're probably gonna abandon you. Probably not trustworthy, right? And so those seeds were sown in her heart way back then at age three. And what do you know? As an adult woman, those seeds are causing problems in her ability to relate to a man and have a healthy relationship. So ministry with this woman uh, dealt, uh, first of all, a lot around her relationship with God because it turned out that because she had difficulty relating to men, uh, that also transferred into her relationship with God. She really kind of wasn't sure if God was trustworthy. She wasn't sure if God was going to stick around for her. And so ministry involved trying to go to the Lord in a manual prayer and we talked to him about that and we asked him uh, about who she was, rediscovering her identity and self-worth and taking baby steps in the direction of beginning to first of all trust her Heavenly Father. In that Emmanuel experience, she heard things from the Lord, specifically heard him speak to her about who he is to her and his urging to trust, to trust him. It's okay, is he safe? Can you trust him? And she felt encouraged to begin to walk in a new direction. And when, when people are, are learning to trust or beginning to trust and they're having a hard time with that, sometimes I'll say to him, I'll say to them, well, how about this? What, what if you gave God one week of your life and, and you, you, said, you surrendered, you said at the beginning of the week, Lord, I just surrender my life to you. I'm gonna choose this week to trust you with all of my, all of my being, I'm gonna trust you this week and I just want to see if you are who you say you are. Are you trustworthy? Give him a chance. Give him a chance. Test drive, God, test drive God's trustworthiness and see what happens. Because we know God's not going to let her down. God's going to prove, yes, you can trust me. But that requires her to surrender, give, that, give all of her doubts and fears to him, give him a week and just see what God can do. Do you have any, any questions? Anybody want to comment on that? Is that the same lady? No, that's somebody different. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it could be. It could be. Well, a lot of these things, yeah, could be, could be. No, that's, act, that's actually somebody different. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. So... Um, Okay, so, so we, read the, we read those other, did we read those other questions? What do you got, think about that's true? Have you grabbed hold of it? We, we read those. So um, a, a lot of this also revolves around the idea of, of lies and what lies people are believing. 
And actually, what I found to be the two biggest lies that people believe are, number one, God isn't good. And number two, I'm not loved. And both of those lies can become unraveled the best, I think, when a person has an Emmanuel experience of the Lord's presence. When they come into that Emmanuel place and the Lord begins to interact with them, that's the place where these lies can be laid down once and for all. Okay, the next category is childhood trauma. As you, as you know, as prayer ministers, often the issues we deal with in the present are unresolved issues from our past. And we need to, we need to uncover what these are. We need to figure out what they are because any pain that is not transformed is transferred. I'm just going to say that again. Any pain that is not transformed is transferred. Any unhealed pain within you is going to most definitely spill out onto your spouse, onto your family, onto your coworkers, people at church, your friends. It just comes out. You can't hold it in. So the question is often, what was it like growing up in your family? What belief systems defined your family? So I'll give you an example of a man who came to see me for, for prayer. He came in and he was, he was all upset. He said, well, he said, my wife and kids told me that I'm controlling. I'm, I'm too controlling and that I need to see somebody about that. So here I am. <laughs> I said, okay, well, John. Are you controlling? <laughs> he said, well, I just can't accept that. I am who I am. And I've always been this way. <laughs> really? You've always been this way. So when someone says that, I've always been this way, that means that this has been around for a long time. They've been dealing with this. So probably it has to do with their growing up. Okay, I'm, so I sort of made that assumption. So I said to him, well, well, tell me about your family growing up. What was, your, what was the family culture like in your family? Well, he said he grew up with two alcoholic parents. He was the oldest of three boys. <laughs> Bless you. And as the oldest, he was expected to do four things. Number one, keep the house organized. Number two, clean up after his parents. Number three, bless you, keep the family secret. And four, don't do anything to rock the boat. Okay. <laughs> hey. Hey. Barber, don't rock the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hmm, what about that? So I said to him, well, it sounds like or what I'm hearing is that you, as the oldest son, needed to take control over all the basic functions in your home, to family. Is that, is that right? He said, yeah. I said, well, what, what bad thing do you think would happen if you didn't maintain control over all these things? And he said, this is a quote. What hit the fan? <laughs> and I said, well, gosh, it seems like you're adopting that same belief that you learned about growing up with your own family right now, that you need to control them or else. And I said, so what, what do you fear would actually happen if you didn't control them? What would be the worst thing that would happen if you didn't if you stop controlling your, your family. And he said, well, maybe they wouldn't respect me. So that's your fear. That's really what's underlying all this, is that you're afraid 
that your family won't respect you. Have you ever, I asked, ever spoken to your family or your kids about this, about this fear? He said, no, no, I never have. I said, well, would you, would you be willing to do that? I think that would really be helpful if you shared from your heart what you were really feeling. So he said he would be willing in prayer to lay that down. So he did some good work to confess that he was carrying this, this control around and he was fearing his, his family, uh, uh, you know, that they wouldn't respect him. And so I prayed and just asked Jesus to uh, take the control, the spirit of control, out of his heart and his mind and help John lay down any residue of control at the foot of the cross. He had confessed and repent and had actually asked for forgiveness as well. And then I asked, I said, Jesus, what, what do you want to give John in return once he lays down this, this control and this fear of his family not respecting him? And he said, he said, well, he said, I do love my family and I want them to know that. So Jesus, I ask you to lead John in his conversation with his family and with his wife and his daughters and help him lead the conversation from a place of love. This is coming from a place of love in him. Release a spirit of reconciliation a spirit of love into the conversation and help John and his family begin to restore what they've lost. Reconnect them, Lord. Because this is really all about your son wanting love and respect. Help him to get to that place. Help there be understanding and, and peace. Do you have a question? Yeah. When you are, you know, uh, saying these things that you're asking Jesus, are you sharing them? With oh, yeah. John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm asking those questions out loud and then seeing if he's sensing anything or hear what the Lord is saying. Yeah, I just ask those out loud. Yeah. Well, sometimes when you're talking, you say things that you... Oh, okay. I'm not really, yeah. You're not differentiating which ones you're... Okay. I'll, I'll try to do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, but most of the questions I'm asking Jesus, I ask it out loud directly because we're, I'm looking for, you know, I mean, I can come up with some answers and stuff for him. I can kind of sense what's going on, but I always want to give Jesus a chance to speak, see what he says, and then, and then minister into that, affirm that, bless that, take that a little deeper through my own prayers, but give the Lord the chance to speak because he usually always does. That is, that is his heart. So other beliefs, other beliefs uh, that, that a person could believe from their family of origin. Was there a belief, for example, that you needed to be self-sufficient as a child? Sometimes that's a belief system that gets rooted in them. Did your family have a belief that children were to be seen and not heard. That often is something we need to deal with. Did your family believe that emotions were allowed to be shown or not shown? I gave an example of a woman last time who uh, got very clear direction from her parents that she was not to show her emotion, that that would not be received well. Another question, how was love offered? Was there an openness of heart in giving and receiving love in your family? Describe the way that your mother and then your father showed his or her love for you. Did they? And if so, what was that like? What did that look like? Was their love conditional or unconditional? These things from an early age get rooted within us and are things that will show up later in life. So these are good questions to ask. So when there's a love deficiency, we ask Jesus to stand in the gap between the mother and the father 
and to pour out the fullness of his love to overcome the places in a person's heart that are craving the true, authentic, unconditional, life-giving love of God. We know, too, that Jesus, or God, is the perfect parent, right? No parent is perfect. We all make mistakes. It's just the way it is. But Jesus can be the perfect parent in your life if you will receive him in that way. He's not a human. He is God. And he will never leave you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he will never let you down. How was discipline administered in your family? What was that like? I'm sure in many homes back when I was growing up, including my own, my mother would at, at certain points shake her finger and say, you just wait till your father comes home. Have you heard that one? What does that instill in a child? Fear. What do you, yeah, you, you begin to think, wow, my father, I'm afraid of him because what am I going to do when he comes home? First of all, he's probably going to come home and be immediately angry at me because my mom's angry at me. And he might give me a whooping. He might hurt me. So that instills a sense of fear in a child's heart about their own father. But these things get said all, all the time. What expectations were rooted in your family culture? Sometimes there's positive expectations, and sometimes they're negative. What impactful words were spoken over you, both positive and negative. The negative, we want to break the power, take authority over those words spoken and break off the power of any negative words spoken over the person you're praying for. And we want to affirm and magnify the power of the positive words that were spoken over the person you're praying for. Now, I had a situation with my mom and my dad my dad spoke some really positive words over me, and my mother spoke some really negative words over me. My father told me when I was growing up, I was the only girl in the family. I had an older brother and younger brother. And my father made a specific point to tell me when I was a teenager and in high school and looking to college and beyond. He said, Donna, he said, I just want you to know that I believe in you and that you can do anything that you set your mind to. If you want to have a business career, if you want to go out and be president of the United States, you can do it. I believe in you. You've got what it takes. I thought, whoa, <laughs> really? Really? And it was the power of those words spoken over me that led me, after I went to college and was an English major, which didn't really prepare me for too much, I got recruited by a financial firm uh, an investment bank and ended up selling municipal bonds. Okay, I had no business doing this. I had no experience in this area. They told me they would train me and anyway, and it was my, my father kept saying, you, yeah, you can do that. So if my father believed in me, I did it. I never would have done that without hearing those words from my father. It was a huge blessing. My mother, on the other hand, uh, my mother, at a certain point in, in, in my life, uh, when I was married to my husband, Jack, we were living in Chicago. And uh, Jack's company got bought out, and he was looking for a job. And he got this terrific job offer in Cincinnati. Okay? And that happened to be where his parents lived, too. And so at one point, when we were all excited because it was this great opportunity. And so I told my mom about it. And my mom looked at me at one point, and she said to me, if you and Jack move to Cincinnati, it will be the worst thing you could ever do to me and your dad. I can still hear her saying those words. So here I am. I, my husband has this great opportunity, and my mother just <laughs> puts a dagger through my heart that if I take it, it's the worst thing I could ever do to my parents. 
So needless to say, I had a lot of healing work to do around my relationship with my mother, forgiveness and other things. But I just give you those two examples because they were super powerful in my own life. And I, I'm sure you have examples too of words spoken over you that still reside within you um, and need he some of them need healing. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, let's see, what childhood experiences still feel painful and unresolved? Okay, that's, that's a question that's good to ask. Sometimes people don't know, but sometimes they can tell you, well, there is this one thing that I'm still, that I'm still struggling with. Now, if a person is, has experienced specific childhood trauma, you can ask questions like, is the young girl or boy willing to go to a safe place and talk to Jesus about the pain? Okay, if something happened when the child was younger, asking if that younger version of themselves will go to a safe place and talk to Jesus. Mm -hmm. What place would feel safe for you? Jesus, with your daughter or son's permission, would you meet them in this place where they can feel safe with you? Is there anything the young girl or boy wants to ask Jesus? Jesus, is what happens to the young girl or boy their fault? Because often, younger children believe that when anything ever happens bad, it's their fault. They don't have the ability to process it like an adult would. So is it their fault? And Jesus, will you give the young girl or boy an image of your love for them? An image. Maybe it's a picture. Who knows what it could be? Ask the Lord to show them that. And Jesus, what does the young girl or boy need? to fully receive your love. Jesus, come and restore what the enemy has stolen. You know, the enemy will move in very quickly and try to rob a person of their childhood. He will steal their joy, their laughter, and also something else. It's their voice and their ability to play. Think about that. When a person has been through trauma and they've spent their whole life trying to protect themselves, be an adult, not let anybody know what's happened to them, they forget how to play. Sometimes I'll ask people, what does play look like for you? How do you play? And often they'll get a look like, well, I don't do that. I'm an adult, so I don't play. Well. You're supposed to play. God has given you the gift of laughter and of joy. And that inner child, when that inner child gets wounded, sometimes we forget how to play. And so I always like to encourage people to figure out what would feel good to just go out and play and do something purely for the fun of it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to say, um, you know, I have a testimony for that because that happened to me, and I was um, years ago, and I discovered that I was protecting that little child that yes, experienced that trauma. Sure. And man, you know, Jesus came right in and just, you know, opened the door, and and that was one of the issues too, play, and just you know, being a child, yeah. and yeah, and I mean, nothing else works, you know. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that's right. powerful. Yeah. yeah, Jesus said we're supposed to have faith like a little child. The little children come to Jesus. But would you agree that lots of times it's because the um, the person receiving has so protected yes. that you know, and yes. that, that part is sort of yes. And sometimes they feel like they have to be they have to be the adult. Yeah. They had to be the adult in the family that they were growing up in, like John, like John's situation. He had to be the adult and take care of everybody so of course there wouldn't be any time to play or do anything frivolous. Can't do that. Yeah. Or if you're wounded too much and you're protecting your heart, you don't want to expose your 
vulnerabilities yeah. by letting that out. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's really that's really important. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, Debbie. But a child in that situation needs to be able to do that in order to survive there. To protect themselves yeah. at that mm -hmm. point in time. Yes. So you need yes. to affirm that, yes. that you did what you needed to do yes. at that point in time yes. for your own survival. Yes. So we develop coping mechanisms for dealing with the pain and suffering that we deal with when we're younger. And that does. That protects people. It keeps them safe. It's a good thing. But the thing is that when you become an adult and the danger, so to speak, is gone, you don't still need to protect yourself in that way. It's okay to let down your guard and allow that inner child to come out. So that's, that's, that's a really good point. It serves a really good purpose in the moment at the time, but later in life, we receive the freedom to, to do otherwise. Okay? Jesus, what truth has been missing in their experience of you? Jesus, is it okay now to leave this trauma behind? Is it time to close the door on this and begin to walk in freedom and wholeness? Good questions to ask. Well, let me give you another example of a woman. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, okay, so there was a woman I ministered to, we'll call her Tammy. And she was uh, a woman's ministry leader in, in her church. And she had really good ideas to share. She took the initiative on issues, but it was really hard for her to kind of speak up with a strong voice. It was hard for her to be taken seriously. She kind of was timid and shy and just kind of held back. So I asked her about her life growing up. And I, I've never heard of this happening before, but this is what she said. She told me that she lived the first six months of her life with a detached esophagus. And she literally had no voice at all. And she was sent to live with another family member somewhere else. I don't know, I don't know why, but she was sent to live someplace else. And so how do you think she felt? What do you think she took on in terms of belief about herself? She felt rejected. She was rejected. She was unworthy. She had a defect and her parents no longer wanted her. And I don't know what the details truly were, but that's what she said she felt. And so it was in an intimate time of prayer and, and, and a personal Emmanuel experience for Tammy that for the first time she began to receive the healing that she so desperately needed. She was able to get to a place with Jesus and she saw Jesus coming over and giving her a hug. And she said that she had never received a hug growing up, never. And so isn't it interesting that that's the way Jesus encountered her by coming to give her a hug. And so the Lord began to speak from that place of connection with her, speak into her life about the truth of who she was. And, and, and she, she was this sort of wilted flower when she came in. And she just began to sit upright. She began to feel filled with the presence of God and the Lord came and just there was a visible difference on her face and in her body and not long after that God actually restored her voice her voice came back her voice came back and he gave her fresh authority in her ministry like finally that place within her became healed and many people witnessed it at her church. And she had a wonderful, it was a great Emmanuel story to share with others that this is how 
she interacted with Jesus. And this is how her voice returned to him. So, and, and so I just I ministered, I mean, Jesus spoke, and then I, I ministered into that place with what he was saying and affirmed her and prayed all around what the Lord was doing. And uh, it, had a, it had a real impact on her life and on her healing journey. So trauma, uh, trauma also can come and affect really every aspect of our, of our being, uh, our body, our soul, and our spirit. I, I think you, you all know that. Uh, I read something, or I saw something online just a week ago that, that I thought was interesting as it relates to our body. And it said, every cell in your body is eavesdropping on your thoughts. Okay? So the idea is, where are you carrying your trauma in your body? Where, where is it? Sometimes I'll just ask people that. You say, where, where are you carrying that? You're, you're dealing with such and such. Where is that in your body? Not do you think it might be in your body. Where is it? It's somewhere. It's somewhere. They're dealing with it in their physical body. And sometimes the release of cellular trauma in the body comes after emotional healing. I had a young man come for prayer who was, had, a, had had a difficult relationship with his father. He said that his father never once told him, I love you, when he was growing up. So we did some ministry time. He connected with Emmanuel. He did some really good healing work during the time of, of ministry and prayer. But later that afternoon, after, after the appointment and later in the afternoon, he emailed me and he said, Donna, something's going on. Something's not right. He said, uh, it, 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 not long after I left the appointment and got home, I started feeling nausea. I started feeling like I was going to throw up. And, and my body felt achy. It was like I, felt like, I felt like I was getting the flu. And I don't know, it's still here. I don't know what's going on. And I said to him, I said, uh, you know, I think your body is simply catching up with the soul work that you did in your prayer appointment today. Your body's been carrying a lot of emotional stress. There's a lot of stuff in your body. And I think your body is just beginning to release from the body some of these emotional wounds that you've been carrying. So I said, let's just wait and see. Let's go through the night and in the morning and let me know. If it's still there, then there's something else going on and I'd like you to come back in for prayer. But let's just see what happens. And in the morning, he was completely fine. He was completely fine. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure in the moment I just felt led to say that to him, but I think that was absolutely true, that after his emotional healing, his body had to do the work to just let that stuff go. Okay, let's talk about forgiveness. Is there any, any, anything about that? Anybody want to say anything about that? No? Okay. Should we talk about forgiveness? Okay, as you know, there is forgiveness from the head and there's forgiveness from the heart. When people are forgiving, we want to be sure that they forgive from the place of their heart, which means releasing the emotional fallout from the actions that were done. And so uh, focusing on the, on the heart Questions to ask, uh, is there any unforgiveness in your life, just in general? Uh, where in your body do you feel pain or discomfort? What would it take for you to forgive that person? What's been holding you back? Jesus, what do you want to give your son or daughter in exchange for laying down their unforgiveness? I have a ministry example to share with you about Forgiveness, it's, it was the most, it's been the most impactful prayer experience that I've ever had that relates to unforgiveness. And it, it's still, it's happened quite a few years ago, but it still grieves my heart tremendously uh, today. 
a man came came in for prayer and he came in because his wife asked him to come in. I knew his wife, she'd come for prayer. And it turned out that part of what she was dealing with was that her husband, she said, was a, was a sexual addict. In other words, he was out having affairs all the time and it had been happening ever since they got married. They had two small children, two beautiful little girls. And so when I was with her, I, I said to her, uh, I said to her at one point, I said, well, do you think, do you think your husband would come in for prayer? Because if, he, if he'd be willing, I would be very much be interested in meeting with him. Not thinking he would ever want to come in. <laughs> I didn't think he really would, but I thought, I'm going to put that out there. So he comes in. And here he is. Met, he talks about his addiction, very sort of matter-of-fact, matter-of-factly. And he says, that's just the way I do things. I love my wife, but this is just something that I do. And so I started asking him about his family. And turns out his father, he never felt love from his father. He always felt rejected from his father. And so he even acknowledged that his journey was one of being on a quest for love, for people to accept him for women to accept him. And so he began seeking love and approval in all the wrong places. So nothing seemed to be enough for him. Uh, his wife, again, this beautiful family. Uh, once he confessed what he had been doing and the extent of his infidelity, uh, I said, wow, uh, that seems like a lot that you're carrying and you're confessing it now. And are you, are you willing to ask the Lord forgiveness? Are you willing to turn toward God and begin to partner with his plan for your life? Because your, your life right now, you're partnering, partnering with Satan. Okay? You're following him. This is his plan, which is destruction an end of life, an end of your marriage, would you be willing to turn to God? And he said, oh, I don't think I can. I said, well, okay, well, how would you feel if we just asked the Lord about it? What if we went to the Lord in prayer and let's, let's ask Jesus about it if you're, if you're willing? And when I said that to him, I really, I really didn't think that there was much chance that he was going to hear anything from God because, you know, when there's a lot of unconfessed sin, that can often block a person's ability to hear. So, but I never under, uh, underestimate Jesus. So I said, well, it would be okay if we ask the Lord. So he said, yes. So he was able to connect with Jesus actually pretty quickly. And so I said when he's in that place, Jesus, what do you want to say to your son about this? Jesus, I wrote these down because it was kind of a bit amazing. Four things. He said, Jesus is saying that I am to be still. He said, it's okay not to do it. I have something better for you. You are already important. Wow. wow. And so then I said, well, and Jesus, what do you want to give your son? If he lays down his sin today, what do you want to give him in return? And he heard very specifically three things a better family, generational change, children as blessings. I got goosebumps. I remember him saying these words. I said to him, wow, those are really powerful words. Do they lead you now? to be willing to confess and repent and turn toward God? He said, no. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what would it take for you to be ready? 
He said, I don't know. So I said, well, would it be okay if I prayed to the Holy Spirit and asked him to soften your heart so that at some point you might be willing to ask for forgiveness? And better yet, and he said, he said, yes, yes. And I said, well, better yet, would you be willing to speak those words over yourself? and ask the Holy Spirit to do that. And he kind of looked at me. <laughs> and he did. He did. He prayed those words over himself. But that whole situation broke my heart. Because even in the light of God's truth, his provision, his love for this man and his family, this man was not willing to lay it down. So not every time is someone going to be willing to, to ask for forgiveness. Many times they are. And sometimes forgiveness is a journey, as we know. It can, it can take time. I remember, I remember feeling like I had forgiven my mother and being in church one day, and our pastor was talking about forgiveness. And he said, OK, now I'm going to give everybody a few minutes. I want everybody to put your head down and just think about, just ask the Lord to bring up anybody that you need to forgive. And I'm thinking, well, I don't have anybody to forgive. I've done all, done all my work. I'm good. And all of a sudden, this word, the mother, just was like flashing in my head. You know, mother. And I'm like, what? Lord, I've done that work. I've, I've forgiven my mom. And the Spirit made it very clear that there was still some residue of unforgiveness in my heart against my mom. And I had to do some more work. I had to go for prayer and have someone help me, walk me through that. So we know that forgiveness is a journey. Um, but if someone's not willing to forgive, the best thing that I can do, I feel, is to ask the Holy Spirit to soften their heart. Anybody have anything else? What do you do when someone someone won't forgive? Debbie? Or Sonna, I have a question. Okay. Then see what you the say, Ron. The example that you're giving is sounding to me like this person has an addiction. And isn't that more complicated than yeah. um, just saying, well, I, I don't know, you tell me. Isn't that more complicated? There's an addiction to sex or yeah. alcohol or yeah. drugs or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there's much more, there's much more to that whole uh, situation of him needing to get some additional support than just coming in and, and confessing and, and all of that. But that's a really healthy first step to bring it before the Lord and to begin the journey of laying it down and then getting the support that he needs to walk that out because that, since it's been going on for a long, long time, he's going to need some very strong support in order to make that stick. Yes, good point. Ron? Definitely an addiction. Um, I feel like God's leading me to address this forgiveness issue with a friend at church, uh, a leader at church, mm. who would be the last person you would think would harbor any unforgiveness. But, um, and I'm kind of struggling with, is forgiveness for people that have hurt you? What about forgiveness for someone who personally hasn't affected you? but you just feel in your heart you can't forgive him. This is what's going on with this person. And years back, he dealt with a, a uh, uh, murderer um, in news reporting type stuff, <clears throat> a murderer of a, of a child. And we were doing some study on forgiveness in a class one, one day, and he said, I don't think I could ever forgive that person. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, uh, if we can't forgive others, God says he, he can't forgive us if, we can't, if we're not willing to forgive. And he said, well, I understand that, but I don't know how I could ever forgive this person for what he did to this little girl. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with, okay, that wasn't you personally that was hurt. It was someone else. And is that a different kind of 
forgiveness because in his heart, I, I know he's a forgiving person, but when he, when, when he makes that kind of a statement, I'm, I'm concerned that there's still some unforgiveness there that he needs to deal with if he's going to truly be saved. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and yet I don't think he feels like that's an issue. So God has been leading me the last couple of weeks. Now that I'm out of a leadership position with this person, I feel I can address it man to man more yeah. so than leader yeah. to leader, right? And um, uh, just, uh, so I keep thinking about, okay, is there a difference in the kind of forgiveness that we have to deal with when it's something that I'm forgiving someone for hurting me versus I'm trying to forgive someone that hurts someone else? Uh -huh. Have you ever run across the... Uh, I haven't run across that specifically, but I have, I, I do know there's a certain theological way of thinking about forgiveness um, that says that if, 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 if something is so heinous, a murder of a child or whatever, that some, some people might think that only God can truly forgive that sin mm. and that a human cannot, cannot do that. And so if, if the person is struggling because it seems too grave of a sin to, for them as a human to, to forgive, I mean, that, that, that could very well be true. We're only, we're only humans. And so maybe the person can, tech, can take a step in that direction and forgive to the, in the capacity that they're able to forgive as a human, with the human heart, and then ask God to step in and to help with the additional work of forgiveness that only in a way that only he can. Yeah. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it does. It, you just triggered a thought. That I'm going I'm to meet with him and, and go down the path. I'm not sure where we're going, but one thing might be, if you personally can't forgive this person, can you ask God to forgive this person? Yes. Can you use God as your yes. instrument rather than God using you yes. as his instrument? Yes. Maybe, and I'm... I'm I'm expecting he'll say no to that too, but I don't know. You never know. Asking that. You, you never know. And before you go in and meet with him, ask the Lord, you know, soften his heart yeah. to be receptive to doing that. Because yeah. uh, I understand it's something like of a, that grave of a sin that can be very difficult for the human heart to yeah. find it within themselves to actually forgive. Yeah. One of the things that um, I found out that I started doing was. I read somewhere that forgiveness is an action, not a feeling. Okay, that's right. And um, I got in the habit of when somebody really offended me, and I was very angry, you know, <laughs> and, you know, resentful and stuff, I would just make a statement that I forgave him. Even though it still lingered. But I found out what's really effective for me is when I prayed, for God to give me the willingness to forgive. And he's been faithful every time. Yes. You know, and it, because there are some things that, uh, you know, yeah, you yeah. just have a really hard, you know, it's all heinous. <laughs> it's like, exactly. You know? And our, our human heart has a limited capacity to do these things. We just, it's just limited capacity to love, like God loves, to forgive as God forgives. And so we do need to be in partnership with him. He tells us that if we don't forgive. Because if, right. You know, so we need to be sure we partner with him, even if our ability to forgive only goes a certain direction, but then we're asking God to complete that in his timing, in his way, and through his love. It, to me, that feels sort of like a complete. As I said, ask package. You know, the willingness. Yes. Would you please, Father, give me the willingness yes. to do this to do or whatever, whatever, you know, it is. But it really, because I'm. That's good. And he does. And you say he does. Oh, he does. He does. <laughs> you know, it, it's surprising to me that, uh, you know, I can have this kind of like resentment going, and one day, you know, in, in the normal course of things, I'll run into that person, you know, in business or whatever, mm -hmm. and she or he is forgiven. It's like all of a sudden. I feel this compassion for them. Wow. Instead of the anger, I can't live well with any yeah. resentment. I don't do well. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. If you, how do you know if you've really forgiven someone? 
like you're saying, if you can feel compassion for them, if you feel like you can bless them, that's like, wow. that's, wow. then you know something, something's happened there. There's been a holy exchange. And it wasn't because I you know, purposely tried. You know, movement, you know, yeah. myself up yeah. in order to, you should do this. Yeah. I just gave it to him, and I said, you know, you know, and I know, you know, what happened. And, and that's all the, that's so good. the most yeah. important thing to me. I mean, I don't especially care a whole lot about what other people think of me. I, I, I you know, most concerned with what God thinks of me. But when somebody is really rude or dismissive or whatever else, I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he is very faithful, you know, and it's. I'm amazed at the changes that the you know, stuff that's been stuck there yeah. for years and years and years is finally yeah. gone. That was great. And it was God that did it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I had to be willing. You had to be willing. Mm -hmm. Surrender it to him and mm -hmm. invite him in and he's faithful. Mm -hmm. Siri, did you want to say something? Or? I just I think another hard hard thing for for me and I know a lot of people like when you think of people being in prison and all the different crimes that people do there and like like I, I work with the uh, sex traffic victims mm -hmm. and it's kind of like hard to I mean see somebody who's done that to a child and then they go to prison and all of a sudden they have Jesus and and it's like mm -hmm. they're, you know like oh they, they've been saved mm -hmm. and it's kind of like I, I mean, I'm not trying to be a judge or anything, but it's just the whole thing of what they put somebody through, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, they're forgiven, and it, that's just kind of a hard thing. Doesn't feel fair. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, yeah. and, and even yeah. with the ch kids, it's kind of like, you know, that we're trying to get them to forgive, which sometimes they easily, uh, if it's a family member, they can kind of forgive their family people, mm -hmm. but if it's a outsider, it's probably a little different. It, 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 you know, it can take time. It mm -hmm. can take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can only take baby steps into forgiveness. Mm -hmm. it, can take, it can take years, it could. you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's all okay. But the important thing, I think, is what you're saying is invite the Lord to help mm -hmm. soften your heart. Well, one other thing I have to do, um, I was sexually abused when I was five years old, and I saw it was several years ago there was a documentary about a man who was a pedophile and he was in jail because he had, you know, uh, sexually abused children. And it started out, you know, he was in counseling and it was a period of years and he didn't see anything wrong with it. He said, I love children. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how he felt. He felt like he was not doing any harm. You know, he didn't have that conviction and he said that he was. No conscience. And I can remember, and, and it's going to make me cry, the realization that came to him when he realized what he had done. You could see it on his face, in his eyes, mm. and the horror <coughs> that he felt toward himself about what he had done. And I just broke down. I mean, it was, you know, just so amazing. but. Um, it is difficult. I had a difficult time forgiving, you know, my abuser too. Uh, you know, over the, over mm -hmm. the but there's holding it does mean more harm than it does. Yeah. You know, because uh, the per other person's walking around, they're fine. They're not, hand they're not carrying anything. <coughs> you're the one that's carrying it. So you're releasing it for your own ability to be healed and move on in your life. I mean, even with other people who, you know, in a more impersonal way, yeah. you know, uh, it, that, that resentment yeah. is still there. Right, and right. it does you more harm than exactly. it does, you know, <laughs> yeah. else. Yeah. I remember when Nelson Mandela first got out of prison after he'd been in prison for 25 years, um, and they asked him, they asked him, you know, what's the first thing you're going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do now that you're out of prison? And he said, I'm going to forgive my captors mm -hmm. because if I don't, I'm going to remain in prison the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So powerful stuff. And then uh, just one other point, and then we'll, we'll stop here. Um, if we look in the Bible, we look at the power of forgiveness in the Bible. If we look at both Judas and Peter, we look at how their sins were handled. Now, Judas never asked for forgiveness, right? Peter did. And what's the different outcomes in their lives? Mm -hmm. Judas died an agonizing, horrible death. And Peter went on to be the rock, the foundation of the, of the church. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, obviously, people deal with physical issues too. And sometimes the mere act of, of forgiving someone for something that they've done spontaneously healing happens in their body. Francis McNutt talks about this. I've heard him talk about this a lot in his ministry. Like when he would go to a big crowded, you know, uh, revival or conference or whatever, and before he started ministering, the first thing he, he said was, is there any unforgiveness in this audience? If anyone is carrying unforgiveness, I, I call you to forgive that person now. And after a period of time, when people were doing that, were engaged in that, people would report that they had physical issues in their body that were suddenly healed, just spontaneously, mm. through forgiveness. Which sounds amazing, but our God is amazing. And yes. Amen mm -hmm. to that. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, so I just want to take about 20 minutes here at the end for you guys to partner with your partner from last week, if your partner is here to practice a little Emmanuel prayer with one another, which would mean just coming together. Uh, the person who didn't get prayed for last time would come up with just a small issue that they want to work on. The other person would lead them in an Emmanuel uh, prayer experience of creating some hospitality for the Lord to come, uh, ask them to recall a time or place where they were connected with Jesus. What does that feel like, sound like, all of that, and then just do a little ministering. Ask a few questions and just dig into that a little bit. Just have a little bit of time to do that, but I think it's helpful if we just partner up again like we did last week and practice doing some Emmanuel prayer. Okay? okay.